when I knew we were doing Advent again. <sighs> I'm going to cry. I'm sorry. Um, peace. God gives peace beyond anything, anything that the world can give. And we went through that this last year and a half. So I thought it was perfect that we would stand here and tell you it's possible no matter what you're going through. God didn't promise days without pain, laughter without sorrow, or sun without rain. But God did promise strength for the day, comfort for the tears, and a light for the way. And for all who believe in his kingdom of love, he answers their faith with peace from above. We truly have experienced God's peace, and we continue to experience God's peace even in loss. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. We rejoice this Christmas above every other Christmas that I can remember because of the hope that we have in Christ. We know where our son is today. This is the best Christmas he's ever had. And we just rejoice in the peace that God has given us today. Just stand and worship with us. For the ugly, the unholy, for the broken, the unworthy.
may be seated. Welcome to Owego Nazarene Church this morning. Happy Christmas Eve. We are so glad that you're here worshiping with us today. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite our ushers forward to collect our tithes and offerings. And if you will bow your head with me, we'll say a blessing over our giving today. Lord God, we just thank you for coming to earth, sending your son as an offering for our sins. We just pray that in this Advent season and as we celebrate your birth tomorrow, that we will just feel your presence. We ask as we give back to you today, you will help our giving just to extend your kingdom in our community here in Owego and and beyond. In your name we pray, amen. Just a few reminders, join us back at nine o'clock tonight. If you want to worship in our candlelight service tonight for Christmas Eve, the next Sunday is New Year's Eve and we are gonna have our 9 a.m and our 11 a.m. service. Um, And if you are watching online, we will be streaming just the 11 a.m. So we wanna make sure that you tune into one of those. You you can do that the whole time I preach. we, We just hang out up here. Good morning, everybody. Merry Christmas. I'm so excited to uh, just be with you today and to celebrate Jesus and all that he has given us and brought to us. And um, this has been a fantastic year uh, for Owego Nazarene Church. We have experienced God's blessing in so many ways. And we're just excited to be uh, partnering with him as he continues to do unbelievable things in our community to expand our reach and our influence. And today I want to talk a little bit about um, Jesus, if that's all right. Um, so we're going we're gonna to jump right in. And this might not be your traditional Christmas sermon, but um, once you've come here a few times, you'll realize I don't do a lot traditional. Um, I almost made it here with my tie on today, but the wind blew it off and I was, oh, I was so disappointed. But, but we're going to talk about Jesus, Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, this little baby that was born during the reign of King Herod. The wise men came to visit him, and they, they just wanted to see what was happening and experience what the prophecies had said were coming true, and they, they were so excited about it. And this is what it says in um, Scripture. Scripture. Matthew chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 says, When they, the wise men, saw the star, they were filled with joy. Now, remember last week I talked about the difference between being happy and joyful. Uh, They weren't happy that they saw the star. They were filled with joy because they knew after 400 years of silence, after 400 years of not having any interaction with God, not seeing God move, seeing no miraculous movements of God, they were about to experience something they believed was prophesied. They believed that God was now manifesting himself again into their lives. Now, some of you don't like to pray for four minutes and not get an answer from God. So imagine 400 years of being passed along where is God with us? Is he for us? What's going to happen? Um, And uh, kudos to them staying faithful for 400 years, because I can tell you right now, in today's climate, I believe that if God went dormant and we saw no movement of God, no voice from God, no no action from God, we would have already been out of there. We'd have built several other false gods, as did they, because they just needed, we long for this connection from inside us to something greater than ourselves. We've all been through that, and we've all experienced that. But it says they were filled with joy and they entered the house and saw the child with his mother. Notice they didn't, it doesn't say they saw the baby with his mother because they were far enough away from this sighting of the star, from this prophecy that they believed in, that it took them a while to get there. And when I say a while, we're not talking about like walking to Price Chopper. It takes a while to walk to Price Chopper, but we're talking about two years of traveling. And now most nativity scenes, they have three wise men. That's mostly because we can only get about three volunteers to stand outside in the cold. Um, there would have been a lot of wise men, and, and they, would have, they would have been traveling for a long time. And you know there would have been a lot of wise men because these men came to King Herod, 
and they had to convince him that they were supposed to go pursue this. Now listen, if you have two or three people gathered together, they can make up a good story and that's convincing, but the king would have needed a little more proving than three people. He'd have been like, y'all came up with this story on your own. This is a conspiracy. It's like when you have three kids. Your three kids will all turn against you sometime in your life. <laughs> to achieve one of their missions, they will come up with a, with a hugely fabricated lie, and the first one to crack is getting beat down. So everybody sticks to the story, and they will lie to you. So the king was like, I'm not going to take three men's word for it. I need the wise men, and that would have been hundreds of wise men that came together and told the king the prophecy's coming true. Now, the king would have gotten a little uh, upset about that, but they wanted to go see Jesus. So they entered the house, and they saw the mother and the, uh, the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, listen, I, I don't know about y'all, but just out of curiosity in this room, how many of you men are bowing down to a two-year-old? Right? And if I bow down to a kid, it's probably to punch him, right? No, I'm not kidding. I've never punched a kid more than once. <laughs> but I'm not going to bow down. I'll bow down for a few things, but I want you to think about your typical two year old. I heard a comedian say one time, two year olds are like crackheads. And, and this is why he said it. He said, just think of it for a second. Think of the average two year old. He's covered in dirt, right? He's got dirty clothes on, um, he's probably a little toothless. It randomly runs around and screams and hollers, pulls his own hair and the hair of others, bangs their head off tables, throws forks at people. They're like little tiny crackheads, crackers hanging out of their nose. You look them in the eye and then they use the bathroom while they're looking you in the eye. <laughs> and they tell you about it. That's what a two-year-old, I mean, I'm just, it does kind of sound familiar. And we all sit in judgment of people who have two-year-olds because I was that guy. I remember sitting in a restaurant and somebody's two-year-old was losing their mind. And I was like, ooh, man, ooh, get that kid, get that kid. Until the first time my kid ran face first into a pole. And I'm like, why, why would you do that? <laughs> that makes no sense. Until you experience a two-year-old, you don't understand it, right? But these guys, they bowed down before a two-year-old because they recognized who Jesus was, that he was a gift. I like Christmas because I like gifts, if you didn't know that about me. I love to give and receive. I don't even care what it is. Some of the coolest gifts I've ever gotten were when my kids gave us some stuff that they made in art class, and they hand it to you, and you open it, and you're like, is it a turtle? Is it a man? Is it a fish dog? Is it a flying bat bomb? What is this? What is it? And they look at you, and they go, you like it? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I like it a lot. They're like, what is it? <laughs> oh, dang. <laughs> Why don't you tell me what it is? <laughs> and they're like, it's a race car. And you're like, no, I definitely didn't know it was a race car. But I love it. Some of the coolest gifts come um, unsuspectingly. And one of the coolest gifts I ever got was a Bob Ross Chia Pet. Listen, I love Bob Ross, the tiny, the tiny trees, the peaceful birds, right? I love it. I love it. I'm just going to throw a mountain over here. I just love Bob Ross. So I like when I got this Bob Ross Chia Pet, and I was like, this is going to be amazing. But I opened the box, and Bob Ross has no hair. There's nothing on his head. He's, he's just bald. And I'm looking at him, and I'm like, this ain't Bob Ross, because you got to grow the hair. Right? So I'm all excited. So I plant all the Chia Pet seeds in the Bob Ross. I put some water on it, and I sit it in my closet. And every day I'm checking to see if Bob looks like Bob. And he's not looking like Bob. Now, I didn't read the, the, the directions or, or do anything to actually take care of Bob Ross. I just wanted him to do what I wanted him to do. I wanted him to look like Bob Ross. So after four or five months of looking at this thing and it's not, it's not turning into what I want, I just leave it. I just decide it's not worth it. I'm on to something new. That's many Christians in their walk with Christ. When God doesn't do what they want him to do, the way he wants them to do, they may give it a few tries, but the reality is they're not doing anything to actually tend to the relationship. Like if I would have watered Bob and put Bob in the sunshine, 
He'd have froed out in no time. He, he would have been a beautiful Bob. But I didn't tend to our relationship. So it grew stale and uninteresting. And it stayed on the shelf in the closet. And the chia died. And Bob probably got thrown away by my mom a couple days later. And I didn't even miss him. And unfortunately, that's a lot of Christians walk with Christ. Because they're not seeing the results they want, and it doesn't look the way they thought it would look, they shelf it and walk away from it. And eventually, eventually, it dies. See, these wise men, they knew this baby was special. They knew he was special because he was fulfilling the prophecy. So they brought him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And each one of those gifts was specifically uh, brought for a reason. The frankincense was brought because that was to acknowledge Jesus as the high priest, as he was it, right? That, that's one of the things that was associated with the high priest, this access to frankincense. It's like um, you ladies today in lavender, right? Like, you know a woman is into the sense if you walk in and she's got lavender. You're like, I mean, there's whole companies that deal in lavender. That was frankincense. Myrrh was to signify that, that Jesus was the lamb of God, that he was the offspring, that he was the coming Messiah, that he, everything that had been prophesied about him would come true. That's what the myrrh was for. Now the gold, we all know what the gold's about, Right? Woo, the bling, the gold. Gold was very scarce back then and mostly only owned and controlled by really rich people. So to bring gold mostly was controlled by the king. That was a sign of being a king that you had a lot of gold things. So gold was brought because the wise men were acknowledging the authority that Jesus carried as the king. And because he carried this authority, they wanted him to be recognized as a king. Let's play a game, because you're all about half asleep right now, so let's play a game. Let's play Name That King, okay? Simba. There you go. We got it. Gorilla. Yeah, there we go. Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Special orders, don't upset us. Burger King, have it your way. If I worked at Burger King during that era, I would have been so mad. Horror books. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Basketball. King James, stop it. <laughs> Interviews. Larry King, we got him. Famous tennis player. Billie Jean King. Blues player. B.B. King, jazz player. Nat King Cole. Mike Tyson's promoter. Don King, there we go. This was the king that they came to worship. Not some offshoot, not some confused individual, not some thing to make people happy. He was the king. And they came to acknowledge him and bow down to him. They came to pay homage to him, to worship him, because Jesus was a king like no other. There's not another, there's not another king like him. And in fact, 1 Timothy 6.15 says this, for, just, for at just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and almighty God, the king of kings, and the Lord of Lords. He will be acknowledged as the supreme authority, the ruler of all humanity. No other king will be a king like him. Now, when Jesus came, there were a lot of mixed feelings and emotions. And there were three primary responses to Jesus. The first primary response was that of the king. The king didn't want him to be born. He didn't want Jesus. He didn't want to acknowledge him. He actually opposed him. He actually had hatred towards him. He actually wanted to eradicate him. So what he decided he would do was kill every baby that was born in that window that was male. 
And if he killed all the babies born in that window that were male, he would eventually kill Jesus, and then he wouldn't have to worry about losing his crown or his position of authority. He opposed the idea of Jesus. Now, that might sound so crazy, but actually a lot of people today oppose the idea of Jesus because they associate Jesus with hatred. They associate Jesus with a drug problem. They were drugged to church the first half of their life, and ever since then, they don't want to go again. And they don't want it. They don't want to be told how to live, how to act, how to do. Oh, your fairy tale God, your mythical creation, it was all written to make you feel better. Listen, I was one of those people. I was one of those people. I thought that God probably existed in some realm, but the idea of Jesus, no thank you. And if there was a Jesus, nobody could decide what he was really like because the church itself spent more time fighting about the characteristics of Jesus. They were more concerned with people's sexuality than they were with their salvation. And we fought about all the wrong things. And because we were fighting about all the wrong things, there was a lot of us that just said, no thanks, I don't need that. I don't need one more organization telling me what I can and can't do with my life. And that's what I believe church was about. I believe the church was there to control me. Now that I've gotten older, I know that's the government. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The FBI will be at my house later. The Jews couldn't believe that this would be Jesus. Because, come on, you're seriously going to tell me this baby that's born is going to be the answer? This little baby is going to be the answer. And they didn't want to think about Jesus in the terms of being born out in a manger, out in the wilderness. Listen, the Jews were like the upper middle class people or the high class people. They did not want to have dirty hands. Remember, that was a big deal for them. Ain't none of them out there working at that time. They wanted to have others do the work. The, the, the Pharisees weren't out in the fields plowing in the morning and at service at night. They had other people do that for them. So there was no way they were going to acknowledge that their coming king, that the great Messiah, would be born in a barnyard with a bunch of animals. And he wasn't. He was born in a cave, just so you know. But um, we like the idea of a little barnyard manger. It makes us feel better. And I definitely like the animals. And so they thought Jesus, if he was really born, if he was really the king and coming Messiah, he'd be born in a little cradle with purple sheets and Gucci slippers on, right? <laughs> They were like, he'll have some Louis Vuitton on. He's not just going to be born into this world as a simpleton. They definitely didn't expect the Savior, Messiah, that would be from Nazareth, that would be the son of a carpenter. Come on. That's just got nothing to offer us because they didn't believe in the whole um, Holy Spirit impregnation thing. They just thought this was Joseph's kid, right? And they're like, there's no way a Messiah comes from that. Nothing good comes from Nazareth after all. No one predicted that the Son of God, the King of glory, the the coming Savior, would befriend prostitutes. No way. There's no way a future king would be out on the streets healing beggars and fixing blind men and making people see. There's just no way this could be the king that's coming. There's no way that he would do those things. They never imagined that he'd want to hang out with a bunch of teenage fishermen. Nobody wants to hang out with teenagers, much less teenage fishermen. No king, I mean. I do. I love you. (laughs) They just couldn't imagine that idea of hanging out with tax collectors. They couldn't imagine that the coming king would encounter a woman who was in adultery, and instead of chopping her head off or hitting her in the face with a rock, that he would forgive her of her sins, that he would restore her to righteousness. They couldn't believe that. That's That's absurd. There's no way. It's literally absurd. They never thought that king would have grace and mercy. They never thought that he would confront church leaders about their own hypocrisy, misusing the temple for profits. They never thought he'd come in and kick over tables and drive everybody out. Not not our king. Our king would understand commerce, the need to make some money. He wouldn't come in and do those things. There's no way that he would ride into town on the foul of a donkey while a bunch of homeless outcasts were cheering for him 
hollering that he was the Messiah. There's no way that's their king. No one would expect him to stand trial for crimes he didn't commit. You know one single politician who's volunteering to stand trial? And they did commit the crimes, much less for crimes they didn't commit. That they would take a guilty verdict for something they didn't do? That they would, that they would be whipped and beaten and go to a cross and die for the indiscretions of you and I? No king's going to do that. No king's going to volunteer to do that. They couldn't believe that he'd be buried in a borrowed tomb and that three days later the stone would be rolled away and that he would raise back to life and ascend to the right hand of the Father where he sits on the throne today, not their king. He couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. that he would spend his last moments saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Not our king. Our king would be powerful. He would be strong. Herod opposed Jesus as king because he didn't want to give up the throne. People today oppose Jesus because they don't want to give up their throne. You know people in your life who don't acknowledge the authority of Jesus in their life because they're self-righteous and selfish. And they attend church every week. But they're about themselves, not about Jesus. They come to this place because they're fulfilling an obligation, not because they're seeking the Lord, not because they're looking for the king. The wise men came because they were looking for the Messiah. There were three common responses. One was Herod's, opposed the king. Two was the Jews, dismissed Jesus as king. You know that Jesus, his coming was quoted five times in Micah, five times. The Pharisees were less than five miles from Bethlehem. So they would have saw this whole thing playing out and they didn't travel five miles to see if the star was the fulfilled prophecy. I'm telling you right now, I see a light in the sky. You know them little lights? <laughs> it could be 40 miles away. I gotta go see what it is. I don't wanna miss something. I'm like, what is it? What is it? They didn't go five miles to see because they dismissed Jesus. They dismissed the whole idea. Today, a lot of people dismiss the importance of coming to see the king. Ah, I didn't make it to church for three weeks. You know what's funny? When I run into people in, in the community who haven't been to church in three weeks, you always do this. Oh, I'm sorry, pastor. Then I gotta figure out what you're sorry for. I'm like, okay, what is it? What happened? I haven't been to church in three weeks. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I understand you're busy. I understand you have other things to do. I understand life comes at us fast and our schedules fill up. And I don't want to shame you or make you feel guilty by saying, well, I guess Jesus falls in after Little League or Jesus falls in after family dinner or Jesus falls in after your homework or after your busyness or after your only day off. People tell me that all the time. Sunday's my only day off. Well, where better to spend it than in the presence of the king? I mean, just for me, where better to spend your day off? We got services all day long, so you don't have to worry about getting up early. Like, what better place to be when you don't have anywhere else to be than in the presence of the king? But we get busy, and we dismiss Jesus. And you know, a lot of people who would call themselves Christmas, they treat Jesus exactly like we treat Santa Claus. Everybody gets excited about Santa Claus. He's coming once a year. Here he comes. And listen, I'm not an anti-Santa Claus pastor because I love presents. So come on, Santa. <laughs> Santa, baby. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not against it. I'm all for it. I'm fine with it. But here's the truth. We treat Jesus like we treat Santa. Oh, he's going to come around a couple times a year, once a year. And the only time we make it to church 
is for Christmas or Easter. And we're not there pursuing the king. We're there so the family member next to us will get off our case. Or because they've given us the motherly guilt. All I want for Christmas is my whole family in the pew. (laughs) Seriously? I was going to get you a Rolex. (laughs) That's all you want? You got it. I had an old pastor one time who called them CEOs. Christmas and Easter onlys. So when he'd get up to preach, he'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas and Happy Easter, because I probably won't see you until then. Just want to knock that out. And I always felt like that was a negative thing, because, hey, at least they're there, and we're planting some seeds, and I don't want to shame you if that's the only time of year you come to church. But here's what I want to tell you. You're missing out on the presence of the King. You're missing out on the blessing of Christ being in your life 365 days a year. Listen, I get it. I dismissed Jesus for a long time because the whole idea of church had turned me off to him because every picture I saw of Jesus was this pale, white, golden, flowy hair guy carrying around a lamb and blowing kisses to babies. He was so soft. I'm like, dude, eat that lamb. Like, come on. Man up. Everything I saw about Jesus was so feminine. His robe like flowed. It was like a Fabio commercial. (laughs) I was like, what am I watching right now? I want no part of this. Punch that dude. When I heard the Bible stories, you hit me with that whip. We're going to fight, right? Like I wanted a manlier Jesus. I'm not bowing down to no two-year-old. I'm not getting on my knee for anybody else until I started to realize who God was. And you know, not once in Scripture does God ask us to bow our knee. Never. He never asked you and I to bow down before him. He just asked us not to bow a knee before any other God. It's an assumption of his that we'll know he's the king, and that we'll take a knee before him. Because this is what scripture says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is king. The baby grew up to be a man and he was a manly man. You know, when I started to love Jesus, when, I, when he flipped the tables over, I was like, yeah, boy, get in there. When it says he grabbed a a whip and started lashing the animals and clearing the place, I was like, yeah, get him, Jesus. When the Bible talks about him coming back and parting the sky and fire and balls flaming down and the big sword and tongue, I was like, yes, that's my Jesus, manly. Not that soft powder puff, Jesus. (laughs) And then I started to understand that what Jesus was doing was manly. Because it takes a man to show compassion to somebody else when they wrong you. It takes a man to see people hurting and defend them, to want to protect them, to not think you're better than them, but to lift them up, to take a lesser position. It takes a man to follow. It takes a man to lead. When I started seeing that kind of Jesus, I was like, oh, now I get it. When when he's cradling the orphans and the widows, he's protecting the weak and making them strong in their weakness. And I was like, "I, I can get down with that. I can bow a knee to that. I can be in pursuit of that. See, my idea of Jesus was wrong all along. And I had dismissed his power and authority in my life. But I needed to be like the wise men who bowed down. You know, bowing down is the highest form of worship. It's really saying the Lord is above me. He's more, he has more authority than me. I remember when I first felt that urge to go to the altar, the Lord was like, go to the altar. I was like, shut up. That's how me and Jesus talk. He usually wins the battle. It's like my wife. (laughs) But I didn't want to go. Because that, to me, was unmanly. Like, the idea of going down front was not manly. And I worked really hard for, like, three straight sermons to sit in the back and cry like a man. (laughs) 
I'm hyperventilating back there. <laughs> Sucking it up. I was the guy that every time it got heavy, I went to the bathroom. Got to pee. I didn't need to pee. I just couldn't take the weight of my own sin pressing down on me. And the idea of it going somewhere freaked me out. So I'd go to the bathroom. So don't think you're fooling me when you get up in the heavy moments. Because this is what I do in my mind. I go, get him, Jesus. <laughs> I put that voodoo on you. Get him, Jesus. That's what, that's what happened. I was sitting in church and I started to feel unmanly because I was having emotions. I was going to respond in a way that I couldn't control. Listen, when I came to know Christ and really know him and follow him, for the first month and a half, this is how I talk to people. Hey, I'm Jake. <laughs> I'm Jay. Nice to meet you. I get up and talk about my kids my precious little demons, I would talk about how much they meant to me. I'd talk about how my wife let me back into our marriage when I didn't deserve to be in it because of the things I'd done. And when I started to realize I hadn't done them to her, I'd done them to God. That she was suffering from the sins I chose. When I realized that I was playing games with God, that I used him, I'd come and go as I pleased in and out of this relationship. Oh, God's got me. He'll take care of me. We have an understanding. When I realized that my life was about more than me, I hated that moment. I'm going to tell you, I didn't run to the altar in joy. I slumped to the altar in fear that everybody behind me was talking about me. I was going to get up and see who was looking at. Who's looking at me? I did not want to go. But everything else I'd tried in life had failed. And I came to God this way. Lord, if you can use an idiot like me for anything in the kingdom, go ahead and try it. I was daring that dude. I'll go all in if you think you can actually do something. Very scriptural. Lord, if you can heal me. If, if, that's what God was saying to me. If I can heal you, wait till I heal you. But I had to get to that point of surrender. I had to get to that point of bowing down before Jesus. What about you? What's your response? Do you oppose him? Do you dismiss him? Or are you willing to bow down and worship him? Are you pursuing him? Christianity is not about rules. It's not a system. I'm not asking you to know a deeper religion. I'm asking you to have a relationship with Jesus. The king of the Jews who was hung on a cross and died for you and me. He didn't stay a nine pound, six ounce baby wrapped in silver linen. He died for you and I so that we have the opportunity to acknowledge him. Something about Jesus draws me to him. Even in my darkest, most nonsensical days, I knew there had to be something bigger. There had to be something better. It's because Jesus is not a distant, far off, unassociated individual. He's not uninvolved and angry. He's not the man upstairs, the big guy in the sky. He's not your homeboy. He's your king. A king like no other. A king of glory and righteousness. King of ages. That shelters the weak. Helps those in trouble. Gives you strength when you're weak. Makes darkness tremble. Oh, I, love, I love singing that. I love singing that. He makes darkness tremble. 
He brings peace, hope, joy, comfort. Will you bow down and worship him? Probably the best explanation I've ever heard of Jesus came from Reverend Lockridge. Reverend Lockridge was invited to speak at a church. Given no warning, they just said, Reverend Lockridge, would you tell us who Jesus is to you? And this is what he said. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You see, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! When I hear things like that, I just want to run a hot lap. <laughs> ah! That's your king. And the gift he's looking for at Christmas is you to bow down. It's you to surrender. It's you to stop running from him, stop manufacturing a life without him, and do life with him. You want to experience the blessings that God has for you, they're found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing in the world will satisfy what you're searching for but Jesus. All the things. And here's the thing. Some of you think that you're too far gone for Jesus to love you. You think the things you've done in the past are so heinous, so wrong, that God can't have space for you. But I'm here to tell you today, there's nothing more he desires this Christmas season than to have your heart. 
to bestow forgiveness upon you that you don't deserve, to restore you. You don't have to do a single thing but stop running and bow down and surrender your life to Christ. He'll do the rest. I mean, you get to do a lot more, but he'll do the big part. He'll remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. He'll see you as new, made new in his eyes, as holy and righteous and worthy. He is the king of kings, and he died for you and me. And some of you need to stop. You need to stop living on the edge of a relationship with him and really get to know him. Do you know him as your savior and king? If not, during this song, the altars are open. And here's what I'm gonna invite you to do. Something pretty simple. Take your place in the kingdom below him. You're not his equal. He's your king. Be willing to serve him and watch what he does for you. If your life doesn't change, I give you a money back guarantee. He wants to change your heart. He wants to change your life. But you got to stop running from the king. Son 
Sometimes as human beings, it's hard for us to get into a position of submission. It's hard for us to say, I don't have all the answers. It's hard for us to say, I'm dependent on something bigger than me. But in our weakness is where we find the strength of the Lord. It's in our vulnerable, broken, challenging times that we lean not on our own strength or understanding, but on that of the Lord to lift us and build us and encourage us to bring joy and peace and light, hope into our lives. Because without it, man, it's a dark place. We're getting ready to sing Silent Night. And one of the coolest stories about Silent Night comes from um, the U.S. and Germany fighting each other, battling it out, and calling a ceasefire one night because of the words of this song that even in other countries, in other languages, brings peace and hope and restoration. I want so badly for some of you to experience peace and hope and restoration in your life. And it's found in Jesus. So I want you to think deeply about that as we sing this song. We're gonna light the last candle first. The candle that signifies Jesus as our King. And then we're gonna spread the flame across this room and we're gonna hang on to the hope that's found in the light of Christ and the joy and peace that accompany it. Father, as we come to you during this time, we just want to spend a moment thanking you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we have so many things that we prioritize in our life that oftentimes we fail to prioritize our relationship with Jesus. Would you help us focus our lives on him Lord if there's someone here tonight that needs a relationship with Jesus don't allow them to use Christmas as a pass through to the rest of the year hold them here for a moment and let them experience the mercy and goodness of the risen Savior they're not here by accident today they may have came to make someone else happy, but the reality is they're here so that you can transform their life, so that you can have a lasting effect on the relationship with them. Would we reflect tonight on your goodness, 
and your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to give our hearts back to you and recenter our lives on you, to be the gift you ask us to be this year, surrendered to you. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who died for our sins. We ask that you watch over us, bless us, and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, we're inviting you back tonight at 9 p.m. Uh, the answer to a lot of people's question is it's a totally different sermon and it's a totally different feel. So we want you to come back and join us tonight at 9 o'clock. God bless you. Be safe. Merry Christmas. Go in peace. You are loved.